I'm Jim Peck. Welcome to MSU Today in Studio. My guest is Carl Taylor, who's a sociology professor here at MSU. He's a leading expert on youth culture, gangs, and violence. And, uh, Carl, as I say that, I wonder if those three things almost always have to go together these days. They don't have to, but far too many times they do. One of the problems is that youth culture uh, is uh, always pushing the envelope, it seems. This is a time when young people are kind of spreading their wings. And in recent years, it seems that youth culture has been synonymous with violence, um, gang violence, individual violence, moving quite fast. So unfortunately, it seems like it's always the case. But we have a lot of kids who are not violent, but there are a lot that are. One of the things that I look at is that it's changed quite a bit. Uh, in earlier times, when I was a young lad, uh, we did. We would seal ourselves off from those who were being violent. That was part of what my parents, my grandmother, and others taught us, that if someone else is being violent, you head the other way. Unfortunately, today, it seems that those who are nonviolent are not only spectators, but in many ways silent supporters. They won't step up. So that's a big difference, and we're trying to find out what's going on. Is that kind of the, you know, bad things happen when good people say nothing? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it really is. But it also is a reflection of the larger society. You know, when we have uh, senators and others who do bad things and none of their peers step up, then young people reflect the larger society also. No one ever wants to talk about that. But that's part of what the problem is. Well, you know, you, you talk about uh, senators and the government, and, and they do a lot of talking about today's youth. Right. They, they always point it out as one of the problems, one of the challenges, the things that we have to point out in society. Uh, do they do enough to speak to that youth? Absolutely not. Um, many times that is not the guys who are voting. And so what they do is a lot of hypocrisy. Now, I'm not saying all politicians, but many do. They just give lip service. And the really bad part of that is young people are very bright, and they look at that. So they see us as being hypocritical, and they don't take us serious, and that you're just running your mouth, and you're not here when I need you. And so that makes it even more complex, more difficult for us. We certainly see in society doing a terrific job of trying to market to these kids, though. I mean, I mean, we're trying to sell them things that yeah. it's a desirable demographic. So, right. so why, why, how are we missing the the real messages, not just the sales messages? Mm, the almighty dollar has taken over, and you're absolutely right. That's a great point. I mean, you look at we sell them cars, we sell the food. Youth culture is now a major target, and so what happens is that kids realize that, that uh, yeah, 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 you just want my money, which is the way it really is. Uh, one of the areas that does a great job of connecting to youth culture is advertisers. Uh, if we could only attach ourselves to advertisers and change the message a bit, we would do a lot more with young people. Do you think you can make it cool to be good? Great question. A really great question. Um, I hope so. I mean, I really do. I think that's important. I think right now that I'm talking to professional athletes, uh, guys out in the street saying that um, violence is not cool and that uh, beating your girlfriend up or now we have an equal swing the other way girls beating up boys the violence is just out of control there's no question about that but again I think that when you have uh, like unfortunately we have our guys in the NBA on the NFL shooting themselves and I'm not digging at these guys in a personal way but those are the examples but also when young people are in homes that are violent, and that's the way the father has taught, that I rule with my fist, or worse, with my gun, then it confuses young people. So um, also we've seen a, a tough mom, a tough mom that is not taking the, uh, the walk down nonviolent lane. Tough moms inspire their children, just like tough dads. But uh, I'm not surprised. My research is very close. We look at why shouldn't young women be violent? When everyone is violent around them, that role of sitting back and take it and don't say anything, that day is long gone. These young women now are stepping up. That's not where we want them to step up. But women are swinging it out here, and my research is just as well as young men. Is this a Detroit problem, a Michigan problem, a, 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 a national problem, or is it truly global? I mean, do you see is, this? Yeah, it is global. There's no question. A lot of people are feeling very good about framing it as a Detroit problem. And let's be blunt. Many times it's seen as a racial issue, black or brown or whatever. But this is an issue I would tell you. Now, look at the middle class. It's a race and issue class. Middle class children or young people who are caught in violence is rising all the time. And then, of course, there's someone who will counter me. Say, oh, no, no, not really. 
Let me tell you, you did not pay attention when it was, quote, a Detroit problem. It is now a not only a, a suburban, it's rural, it's everywhere. Young people have the capacity to be violent. They're looking at a society that is violent, and they're not buying it. So that is what our problem is. We're not being honest. What we care about in the general sense is money. We're getting paid. Our movies, look at the synthetic violence. These kids entertain themselves, and some will say, whoa, uh, and I would agree, whoa. I have a lot of young men and women who look at video violence, and they don't do violent things. But I have plenty that do, that don't understand that that is not reality, that is a video game. So we do a lot to encourage violence, and we're hypocritical for not taking uh, the stand that uh, we're talking on both sides of our mouth. Are we also being hypocritical to say, well, you know, I know this is happening over in Detroit or it's happening in New York or, you know, South L.A. I mean, it, um, I don't live there. It right. doesn't affect me. Right. Well, interesting, you know, you made that point uh, on another interview with me earlier, and that is very true. And it's tough today, and that's part of the problem, that until it falls right on your doorstep, many, and I've been, I, I also have been uh, guilty of this, that we don't take stock in what is taking place. Uh, we are very narrow-minded, it seems, and that's not my problem. Meanwhile, the problem has just grown immensely, and it's almost like it started off uh, as a small problem, and you talked about those kids or these kids, and then suddenly uh, I'm seeing it in attitudes, and that's what I'm talking about. Even when I have kids, I had a young lady stand up in my class the other day uh, from a good, affluent community, and she said, why should I care? You know, she said, why should I care? And she was talking about Haiti and every place else. And everybody in the class was just kind of looking. And then there were those who were in agreement silently. So I addressed that issue. We have a responsibility. Whether or not we take it is another debate. But we do have a responsibility to cease all this madness. We'll be right back after this. You and I walked around through your old neighborhood. And, um, it, and you talked about feeling bad that it's a dangerous place, that it's a place you said you wouldn't take me there after the sun went down because it's too dangerous. I know that's hard for you to go back and see what's happened to your neighborhood. So with that in mind, what does that do to, to kids that are growing up there Absolutely. now? Absolutely. Uh, again, that's just a great point. I um, would awaken in that community to a one-a-day vitamin, orange juice, and cereal. Uh, parents who uh, loved me and kissed me. I went about, uh, my next door neighbor was a, a stout German Catholic woman who had no children. I had to contribute. I had to shovel her snow this time of the year for no money. Those were the values that that neighborhood had. Now that neighborhood looks like I am legend. I can't imagine getting up in the morning, seeing all of, of the decay. And it's not just Detroit. If you look closer, this is across America. You look at Flint. We don't talk about Flint. Flint is flattened, and I don't want the Flint folks mad at me. But what people do not realize is that when there's no more meat on the carcass, they're coming to your community. And some people's answer is a vigilante or circle, get law enforcement and stop you from entering. Your kids are part of this. They see it. So and unless we become not moral but in self-interest, you better help. It, it almost sounds like you're saying that it's not so much about you know, building a wall around your house and, and getting guns or, or dogs or any of that because they may not be coming through the front door. They might be coming through your schools. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. It's coming through everywhere, seriously. I mean, when you can't sit down and enjoy, I go back and I chastise, I protest. The community that I grew up in was a great community with multiple stores, long paw shops. So people say, Taylor, you're, you're choking on nostalgia. But you lose a lot of your freedom. That's what people don't understand. If you want to not be moral, you should be moral to me. But if you don't want to be moral, you're losing more and more of your freedom. And if your backlash is that you think that you're going to grab a gun and kill them, then go look at I Am Legend again. There's, at the end of I Am Legend, everybody's happy. It's not going to work like this. That rage is there. That resentment is there. Uh, and a, a morality is there. A lot of these kids that we're looking at, they're not immoral. They are amoral. They haven't even been taught. So I, I look at the blogs. I have to tell you, Jim, I look at the blogs in this state uh, about issues of Detroit, and they're just, people should look at what they're saying. They say the worst things, like to hell with them. You know, they all, we just blow up the whole damn city. Well, then perhaps we should just blow up the whole nation. I mean, you look at unemployed kids, uneducated kids, and it's the same thing overseas. You know, and when you look in Iran and you look at, uh, they had the young uh, Ayatollah there 
who had all these young boys. These are young boys with weapons with an older guy telling them what to do. And I'm not trying to be uh, facetious. They're also young boys whose hormones are busty. And so if they can't get it one way, they get it through violence. And there's no protest. So we don't have to go overseas. It's right here. We see the enemy, and we're looking in the mirror, but we don't like what we see, so we pretend it's not there. Fighting violence with violence doesn't work? Uh, I have a brother who is an ex-seal who will tell you, of course it works. Uh, <laughs> I say that it's only a temporary fix, and I think that it does more damage. Being violent, um, beating people, scaring them, uh, has already gotten us in trouble. If you look at our prison systems, what's in there is treated very uh, tough, beyond tough. And what it produces is a, a monster. And, you know, I'm, again, I'm serious. Have you talked to these young men who come out? They have no fear. Uh, they're amoral. And they're mad as hell. And I think that we could cut that to three quarters. And we could cut that down quite a bit. That, no, I think we meet violence with wisdom. And we use violence if we have to as a last resort. But I think if I treat you as I would like for you to be treated, me, I think it works. I know it does. It works much better. I have some ex-offenders that have been working for me now almost 20 years. And uh, they know I don't tolerate violence, and I'm, and I'm including, you can get mad, but you cannot get violent with me verbally. If you do, see, take the exit. Uh, it does work. We're talking about the biggest problems that are facing us, and you're basically saying, what's well, the golden rule? You know, every time you and I talk, I talk about my parents and my grandmother. My grandmother lives, and she had a third grade education, seriously. You know, she would talk about, you don't do that to that guy because you don't want that guy doing that to you. And it was just good common sense. And I became shocked along the way of my research when I ran into a father in a barbershop instructing his son that if you got into a fight, come home and get the gun. I almost fainted. You know, the researcher went out the window. I'm like, what are you talking about? Grand said, go the other way. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. Um, there's nothing wrong with stepping up when someone is wrong and protesting. So, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because, yeah, treat me. That's why you and I get along so well, right? I mean, absolutely. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Well, no. Uh, well, obviously, I mean, you know, in, in when talking about that, the discussions we have, I mean, there, there's a give and take. I listen to you, you listen to me. Um, but we show up at the table ready to listen. And right. I don't know that that's happening out there. Oh, absolutely. I think not. But I think the stereotypes, the fear, and the ignorance is what dictates a lot of the conflict. Uh, and I go out of my way, I'm laughing. I said, when they were putting the makeup, I look like Shrek. Uh, I look like Goliath, seriously. And so people get, you know, I speak to people a lot of times and they look at me funny. I'm a happy guy. That's the way I was raised. I, I, I'm really, I'm happy. But people say things to me, even as an academic, they say to me, I wouldn't want to meet you in a dark alley. I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> I don't travel in dark alleys, dude. <laughs> Uh, we have to get beyond the, the stereotypes, and we really have to make an effort at peace. If we made the same effort towards peace that we do with war, I really believe we would do a lot better. We'll be back after this. You talked about your mother and your grandmother and those influences, um, and I hear that and think, well, this is, you know, everybody has a mother. Everybody somewhere along the line has a grandmother, but you're talking about how the roles are changing with women in this society and that, you know, it, it's tough moms and tough daughters and probably tough grandmothers. Mm -hmm. So where is the hope in that, the, the hope that, that you were able to find and hold on to that you still hold on to today? Where is that for kids? Well, you know, yesterday I was, I was speaking with a colleague and I was laughing and one of the mistakes that I think my parents did make and I told my mother that uh, I was raised as if the script that I was given, the playbook that everybody had, everybody does not have that. And I think if I had a kid whose mother was to me horrible, as a matter of fact, I didn't think she was a mother and this kid wanted to buy her a stove for Mother's Day. And in my head I was saying, yeah, right, buy her a stove. For what? So she could cook more crack? I mean, I, I detested her mother. And I had to check myself that you have to approach these problems. You have to be able to see the ugly and be able to deal with it. We don't like ugly in this nation. Once it gets ugly, we're like, I'm out of here or destroy that. And that's what's gotten us in a, a lot of trouble. You have to work with those. We have to have a community standard, which has nothing to do with money. And that's what I'd argue. I have many poor people financially that I look at in urban communities that have great spirit and have rich substance about themselves as individuals. That is what I'm talking about. You have to demand that. In my community, we did not allow violence. 
Uh, the Taylor boys were community property. That's not a cliche. That's principle to me. And that should not change. And that's what I look at reestablishing. You know. But you talk about not just blowing this up and wiping it out, you know, getting in and fixing it. Uh, I listen to you, a lot of people are going to listen to you and say, my God, Carl, you're talking about getting to, to kids, through families, through communities. I, we can't. We can't get them to vote. We can't get them to eat right. We can't keep the kids in school. How, how can we possibly fix this? It seems unfixable. Jim, we do what we want in this nation. We are the greatest nation on the planet. When 9-11 hit, we organized very quickly. We were doing so damn good that we had to go on television and say, stop the money, stop the food. We do what we want in this nation. That's what the American spirit is. If we really want to do it, we can do it. No one ever said it was going to be easy, and no one said that at times there are some that are terminal. I'm not Pollyanna. You know, I look at my younger brother, who's a SEAL, you saw that. He used to ride around, he was an executive. You know, he'd ride with me and say, Carl, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, Dude, this is where we grew up. He said, oh, Carl, come on, come on. You see, now that guy, he's now, he got pissed off waiting for grants and so forth. He reached into his own pocket. He's got these young guys in that neighborhood. He's got them playing chess at that park. He has single-handedly, I'm patting him on the head, but he has single-handedly got out there because he said, my mom, he said, you know, mom used to do, that, do the same thing with the kids in the neighborhood. No one called her a community activist. They didn't call her a mentor. This is just, and my mother had, in that time, a bad girls club. She had all the girls that nobody wanted, all the girls who were potentially getting pregnant, and she made a difference. I think we, either we give up throwing the towel, and don't be surprised, or you see, I like I Am Legend. A lot of people don't like the movie. Or somebody's going to have to take the grenade at the end of the movie and blow up something to save it. But that's where we are. I don't think violence is going to solve this. Um, it's multiplied, and that's really what has happened in Detroit. We are bypassing all the good kids, all the good, there's a lot of good there, but we see ugly so much, and it is ugly. I don't expect for the public to accept the heinous crimes that I'm seeing, you know, but I, I think of a 16-year-old that stood over a man who contributed to a community, had a barbecue place, Milt's Gourmet, and the, had shot the guy already, and the man begged for his life. He said, I'm a grandfather. Please don't shoot me, don't kill me. And the kid killed him. I mean, I, you know, not for... What's going on here? What's the disconnect? It's part of my job and your job and others to, to, to address that. Or if not, at any given time, the, the six-year-old is going to multiply. And I know some people out there have the answer for that, too. But that's not the answer. I really don't, I really don't feel that. I think you'll multiply the hate, the resentment, and more Frankensteins. And we will be right back. We've seen discussions about what's happening in Africa, that people are um, criticizing play, countries like the United States for just giving money and aid and saying, well, the Africans have to pick themselves up, that we're enabling this. Are we seeing that happening here? Are we just throwing money and, and these little bits of advice in, into the fire and expecting it to put itself out? I would, uh, my rebuttal is that we have a, uh, a reasoning for accountability and that if we look at a lot of the money, then I am tough and conservative that the money has to get to where it belongs. The money should not be going to make guys fat and maybe 10% of the money get there and then everybody else is an administrator. Use the money the way it's supposed to and you have, I have college students. We have a lot of people that can train and help. Let's make sure it gets there. It's not throwing money. It is throwing money if you don't want to be serious. If you want to throw the money there and then say, see, I told you, that happens. We are finding out that that has not worked with anybody. These are tough times. So we can't afford to throw anything. You're absolutely correct. But that's not going to, for me, I'm not going to allow that to be a cop-out. You know, you have to be accountable. And that's tough. And if we find that out, uh, many people will walk away from the table. I have to tell you that. There are many folks, black, white, and so they're welfare pimps. Call it what you program pimps. Do they exist? Absolutely. But I say that we cut that down, cut the fat, put the money there, and make the people that are receiving the support make them accountable. They have to be accountable. Young people have to be accountable. Like I told young guys, killing people. So that's what we are. I hold them, do you understand? Okay. That's what we are. We're baby killers. We kill babies. We kill old women in neighborhoods. That's what you are. Because if that's what you are, then it's our responsibility to come together and ostracize and eliminate that guy. We have to demand that we do what we want. This nation can say what we want. We are a great nation. We're the greatest nation. We have shown that time after time. If we want to do it, if we really want to stop violence with young people, then everybody has to pitch in. We can do what we want. We can make songs. I remember being in uh, L.A. years ago with uh, Quincy Jones when uh, We Are the World, 
And that was a great thing. You know, now they're trying to do it again. They're trying to do the same damn cookie cutter we are of the world. We're a different world this time around. And somebody better step up and start talking to these young guys and saying what I'm saying. You're a baby killer. You're a dope dealer. But also saying to the dudes on Wall Street, <laughs> you a Wall Street guy? You're killing me, dude. <laughs> I mean, seriously. We are not being accountable. And I'm, again, I'm going back. I remember when journalism held everybody accountable on the Vanguard. I want Steve Wilson to go after everybody the same way he went after the mayor of Detroit. I want him to go after the fat white guys. I want to go after the fat Mexican guys. I want to go after the fat women. If you're fat and you're getting paid and you're making money off the, the common man, you need to get called out. So why don't you guys, not you, Jim, personally, but why aren't you calling these guys out? Attitude is the most important thing. So if we lose our humane attitude, we're condemned, I think. I really do. Carl, I could talk to you all day. I appreciate your time. We are out of time here on MSU Today in studio. I want to thank my guest, Carl Taylor, professor at Michigan State University, for being here. Thank you for watching. For more on the show and for Carl, more on Carl Taylor, head to our website. I'll see you next time on MSU Today.